Good morning, I'm Dr. Caroline Palmer. I am a coral immunologist and also director of Seeking Survivors, which is a conservation organisation that seeks to conserve biodiversity through community and science. So today I'm going to talk to you a bit about corals and coral reefs, particularly those within area of the and Guanacaste, and how they are now and how they might look like in the future. So coral reefs are made from corals which belong to cnidaria along with anemones and jellyfish. Hard or reef building corals form calcium carbonate skeletons and different species form different shapes and different structures and that's what provides this complex habitat that makes up a coral reef. And the coral tissue and an endosymbiont or an algal mutualist that lives inside those tissues are what gives corals their characteristic bright colours. Now, coral reefs are really important globally. They support about 25% of known marine biodiversity. And in addition to that, they support 500 million people through their ecosystem services, such as providing food, tourism, and protection from floods and storms. So ecosystem services that coral reefs provide are worth about 10 trillion US dollars annually. So they're a really important ecosystem and one of the most biodiverse ecosystems in the marine realm. However, as many of us know, coral reefs are dying. They've been dying for a long time, and this is because a warming ocean due to climate change is pushing corals to and beyond their thermal thresholds more and more frequently and for longer periods of time. What we know is that we've lost about 50% of the world's reefs already in the last few decades, and we're set to lose most of the rest of them by 2050 if we don't act now or we don't act with urgency. So the reason that corals aren't doing so well is because, or largely because, they are experiencing these mass bleaching events which is causing coral mortality. And this has been quite widely reported, particularly in the Indo-Pacific and Great Barrier Reef, and also historically in the Caribbean. Now coral bleaching can be misunderstood. As you can see in these images, the corals that have been bleached appear white, and that's where it gets its name. Those corals are actually still alive. So coral bleaching isn't coral death. Bleaching is when corals disassociate, or the, the relationship between the coral animal and an algal mutualist breaks down. So these algae live inside the coral tissue, and they provide the coral with energy and nutrients that the corals then depend upon. And when temperatures or the environment shifts, the, this mutualistic relationship breaks down, which means that the coral aren't getting the nutrients that they need anymore. And this puts the corals in quite a fragile state, which can then go on to mortality. And that's what we've seen, for example, in the Great Barrier Reef in 2016-2017, where 30% of the corals were lost due to mass bleaching events. But let's get a bit closer to home, to Costa Rica and Santa Marina and ACG. I'm sure this map is pretty familiar to most of you there. And as you can see in the blue, we've got Santa Marina, which is the marine part of Area de Conservación Guanacaste, and it's to the south of Santa Elena Peninsula. So I'd like to draw your attention to these two images and see if you can tell the difference between them. So of course you saw the image on the left just a minute ago, when I was talking about coral reefs generally. And the image on the right is from Sector Marino in ACG. So of course, when we think a picture of a coral reef, we think of nice crystal clear waters that are warm, brightly colored corals and lots of different shapes and sizes. And that isn't what we've got on the picture on the right, which is Sector Marino. Here we've got quite a thick, dark green water that's me diving in about a 7 mil wetsuit with a hood because it was really cold. And we can see that there's rocks and sand and sea urchins and one coral there in the foreground. So it's a very different view to what we might imagine or we might think of for an Indo-Pacific coral reef. And there are several reasons for this. Largely because in ACG and in various parts of the eastern tropical Pacific we get upwelling events which bring nutrient-rich, cold, and more acidic water to the shallows where the corals survive and live. And this changes the dynamics. It means that seasonally they're exposed to more extreme conditions and conditions that are really unfavorable when we think about tropical corals. And this means the coral reefs of Sector Marino are marginal coral communities. 
So they don't form the characteristic big reef structures that we think of of the Indo-Pacific. Instead, we get things like this. So in Bajo Rojo, which is quite close up on Hiriki, we have a big rocky outcrop, which has got large um, mounding or massive corals growing there and a few possiloporas, which are the branching corals that you can see in the middle photo, which is actually by Thomas, which is um, in the river mouth, really close to Hiriki. And here we've got a large patch of these branching possiloporas really close to the mangroves in quite sort of a muddy, silty environment, which is again, is a bit odd for tropical corals. And then out at the islands, this is Isla Cocinera, which is a really beautiful site. It's one of my favorites. We've got a diversity of different corals, sort of sat amongst rocks, and then it's, it uh, goes off to a sandy bottom. So in Sector Marina, we have got corals. We, tend to refer to them as coral communities rather than coral reefs because coral reefs tend to be how we picture the Indo-Pacific where we have large reef structures. Because of the uh, variable and sort of extreme environment of Sector Marino and the Eastern Tropical Pacific as a whole, we have coral communities. So just like the coral reefs of the Indo-Pacific, those closer Kukinikil are really important. They provide ecosystem services. As we all know, Kokinikil is very dependent on its fishing. And as you can see, all the fishing boats are lined up there in this video. I think we were the only ones going out on this wet day. But fishing is essential, and the fish are dependent on the habitat that the coral communities provide. So now I'm going to talk you through some research that's been several decades in the making. And um, it's focused uh, on the coral communities out at Las Islas Mesiélicos in Sector Marino. And this began, this work began in the 1990s with Carlos Jiménez. Um, and I know that he was supported hugely by Maria Marta and the ACG as a whole. And uh, this is a project that has got many different players. And so I'm going to take you through our combined results um, and some of the interesting things that, that this long-term data set has thrown up. So these are the islands, the Bat Islands, or Isas Mosiolico, they're absolutely stunning. And for this work, we looked at several different reef sites and the coral communities within them. And we were focused on the coral cover, so how much coral um, there is taking up space at the bottom of the sea in these shallow reef sites. So Carlos began this in the 1990s. And among all of the different sites that we looked at at the islands, there was between 70 to 80 percent coral cover um, between 1996 to 2002. It dipped a bit in 2006, but as you can see in some of these photos up here, on the right we've got Isla San Pedrito, which is the furthest island out. And it is just a carpet of opera. This is what's called a monospecific stand, or just a, a really large, sprawling carpet of opera, And that's quite common within the wider um, Eastern Tropical Pacific. And so there was a dip in 2006 that sort of recovered in 2007 and went back up to 70, 75%, and, and was more or less stable in 2008. And then if we fast forward just one year on, into 2009, this is what we see. A dramatic and sudden drop from 75% coral cover on average across the islands uh, down to less than 10%. And this, this was in the space of less than a year. And what you can see is on the photo on the left hand side it's a bit deceptive because it looks very similar to the previous photos and the previous slide where there's sort of this carpet extending out as far as you can see but what's different about this image is that the green that's covering those lumps and bumps is not coral it's algae that's actually overgrowing dead coral skeletons so the framework the structure of the coral is still there and that's why you can see the mounds but it's covered in algae and the coral is dead. 
it wasn't just the branch in Coral, the postal operators that were affected in this 2009 die-off event at the islands, but also the, the massive and mounding corals which are found at sites such as Kosciuszko. So fast forward on nearly 10 years now, and what we would have hoped to have seen was that these sites would have recovered, that the fast-growing branching coral species like Porcelopla would have been able to regain that substrate and to recover the percentage coral cover. But that's not what we've seen. In fact, in 10 years at the islands, we've seen little to no recovery in the coral systems and the coral communities that were lost. And I find that very worrying. So here is what San Pedrito looks like now. In 2000, or before 2009, everything you can see here used to be live coral cover. And now if you can look, not at the fish, which are very eye-catching, but at the substrate, you can see lots of lumps and bumps but none of that is live coral. What you're looking at is a, is a coral graveyard. Those are dead coral skeletons that have been overgrown by algae and sponges and other organisms that live on the substrate. And there are animals and crustaceans and things that live within the nooks and crannies there, but there is no live coral, or very, very few. And that's really striking and really devastating. So if we think about why this mass die-off might have occurred in 2009 at the islands, we know that coral bleaching has caused mass die-off events around the world and there have been several of these. So perhaps it's because of that. Maybe it was a thermal warming anomaly that um, caused this die-off. So here we've got mean sea surface temperatures for the Gulf of Papagayo going back to 1990. And if we overlay when the mass global bleaching events were reported, we can see that they don't particularly line up with the 2009 die-off at Ijaz Mosiyanago. Um, the first one on the graph here that you can see is the 1997-1998 mass bleaching event. And this was the, the most severe event to date. But interestingly, the coral communities at the islands in Sector Marino weren't really affected by this bleaching event. Um, in comparison, in 2009, sea surface temperatures in, in this temperature record, but what we do see is an extreme cold event. Now, it's not much cooler than similar events that occurred previously, such as in 2000 and 2001, but there has been a long gap between those events. So perhaps it's more about a cooling than a warming for the corals of Islas Mosiolo. Something else to consider in this area is that although ACG provides wonderful protection and a marine protected area for many organisms, the sea it, you can't you can't build fences around it, and of course there's been a huge amount of development to the south of ACG and Sector Marino, including this hotel which was complete in 2003-2004 and is in Bayaculeva. Now, for the whole of the Papagayo coastline, there has been quite extensive development, and what's really significant for biodiversity of Sector Marino is that we have. Uh, the Costa Rican coastal current, which predominantly runs from south to north. So even though we don't have developments along the coast within Sector Marino, what happens is that the coastal current brings whatever gets put out into the ocean by these developed areas, it brings that north into Sector Marino. So if we think not only about these upwelling events which are causing dramatic cooling of the area, but also think about how development may be influencing algae and particularly harmful algal blooms or red tides in the region. Now, harmful algal blooms are exactly that. It's when algae blooms because there's an increase in nutrients either through upwelling 
of, of cold, deep, nutrient-rich water or from the outflow from development. And this, coupled with the algae be being in shallow, very light waters, causes the algae to bloom. And depending on the type of algae that are within that bloom, they can release toxic substances which are toxic to both humans and also sea creatures like fish and crustaceans. But what's interesting is that historically there are reports of algal blooms, they are a natural normal occurrence, but typically these reports have been sporadic in nature and anecdotal of course, but the reports have been of red tides that are um, brief and not very dense and they're quick to move on. However, if we think, if we look at the 2003-2004 when we saw some development in Bayakulera, we begin to see a very strong red tide and actually red tides have increased in frequency and become much um, denser and have been more sustained so they have been around for longer and sometimes the frequency of red tides has been almost on a monthly basis particularly during the upwelling season when the water is more nutrient dense because it's come from the deep. We've got a bit of a gap in our records here between 2013-2017 in red tides. Now this doesn't mean that they didn't occur, but we haven't had any direct reports of that. And when I say we, I'm referring to myself, Carlos Jimenez, and our sort of network of collaborators and, and people that we talk to throughout ACG and the islands. So to give you a bit of an insight as to what and harmful algal bloom looks like on a red tide. I took this video in 2017 when I was given a tip off that there was a red tide at the islands and so I went out to take a look for myself because I hadn't seen one and it does what it says on the tin. It is a red tide. There is a lens as you can see from the photo of the, the motor of the, the propeller from the boat. There is a lens of algae that blocks the light and stops it from penetrating particularly effectively down and it, it does appear red. It's also very smelly. It can be very dangerous to swim in red tides depending on which algae are there because it it's, can be toxic. So, something else to consider when we're thinking about the arrival of red tides, particularly during upwelling uh, events, and extreme upwelling events is the potential for extreme hypoxia. Now, as we know, upwellings bring deeper water to the surface. Now, in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, we've got an oxygen minimum zone in the deep water. And this means a, a patch of water, if you like, that's, that's hypoxic, it's got very low levels of oxygen. And when that water is upwelled, it's going to bring hypoxic conditions to the shallow waters of coral communities which normally are very oxygen rich and so this these are some photos of um, something that i observed in 2018 during an upwelling event this is hunkiel beach and when we were walking along it we saw dead reef and marine organisms from fish octopus rays all sorts of things which had obviously very recently died and they died very quickly and none of them had any injuries so they seem to have just died in a shock event and when we think about how upwellings can bring cold hypoxic conditions and when red tides can sort of come together with this perfect storm and fuel are uh, being fueled by the upwelling conditions it starts to make sense that this, this could be how and why the corals in 2009 died because corals can't escape even these marine organisms which can move are mobile that we saw on the beach here they weren't able to escape the the extreme conditions of 2018 and perhaps this is what occurred in 2009 so to remind ourselves the data that that we've compiled with Carlos Jimenez data, it shows that there's been no coral recovery in a decade. So 10 years on from that decline from at some sites 90% coral cover, like at San Pedrito, to less than 5% coral cover. 
there's been no recovery in 10 years. And this is really devastating news, but it's, it's really, really important. And we need to work out why. So let's look at some environmental trends in the Papagayo region over the past few decades. So here again, we've got the temperature, the mean sea surface temperature in pink, and we've also added on wind speed here, which is in blue. Now, if you look at the trend lines, you can see that there is a trend for increasing mean sea surface temperature through time and a corresponding decrease in wind speed. And this is in line with climate change predictions. Warmer waters are warming, and at the same time, we're having this sort of die off of winds. And so we might expect to have very warm, still, calm conditions, which are those we typically associate with warming events and marine heat waves, which cause the global mass bleaching events. However, for a region that experiences upwelling with global climate change, we are at, there is suggestion that upwelling events will become stronger and more extreme. So we have a situation here where the corals of Sector Marino and these coral communities may have to survive in generally warmer conditions, but also have to be able to tolerate even more extreme upwelling events. So this is potentially a fairly bleak outlook for our coral communities of ACG. And naturally, and as many people have done around the world, thoughts start to turn to coral reef restoration. I am in two minds about coral reef restoration. I, for a long time, thought that there is, as a conservation biologist, there is no point restoring something if you haven't taken away what's causing it to die in the first place. And this makes the most logical sense. However, when we think in the current context and with global climate change and our inability to stop the rate of change, we're faced with two options. We either sit back and do nothing and watch them deplete and die completely, or we try and do something. Now, I am certainly in the camp of the latter, where I think that we have amazing skills and expertise and motivation to try to do something, and I think that um, we're almost obligated to try. So, there are things that we can explore for coral reef restoration, but I think we need to move forward sensibly and smartly and with evidence. So now I'm going to talk to you specifically about the work that we've been doing with seeking survivors in the ACG. So my approach to coral and coral restoration and coral health overall is an immunological approach. Now, as humans, we have a general understanding of what immunity is. We know that when we're run down and we're tired and not eating right or really stressed, our immunity might be low and we'll be more susceptible to colds and infection. Even from a young age, we know that if we get a cut or a graze, our body will heal it. And we know that if we have something that we don't feel quite right about or we can't see it, then we can go to the doctor, get some blood tests, and we'll be able to move forward with a bit better understanding. We also know that if our pets get sick, then we can treat them and they can heal. So immunity essentially is about staying healthy. As humans, we do this constantly, day in, day out, without knowing about it. And we do this through barriers such as our skin barrier and mucus barrier. We produce antimicrobial peptides which help keep pathogens in check. And we constantly have white blood cells circulating and surveilling to ensure that we are healthy. We also live in equilibrium with a dynamic microbiota. On our skin and in our guts, we have microbes that are beneficial and that we need in order to be healthy. And all of this takes energy, and all of this is occurring when we are healthy. But immunity is also really important for returning to health. So if we do get an infection, if we do get sick, our immune system will upregulate, will produce an immune response, and that will help bring us back to a healthy state. So what about corals? Don't corals do the same thing? Well, for a long time I was told that no, they didn't. 
they don't have immune systems. But then I realized that what people didn't understand was the word immunity. And actually, if I spoke about maintaining homeostasis, which is a lot less pithy, the biologists understood. So maintaining homeostasis, how do corals do this? Well, there are two components, as I just explained, for humans. So we have the tolerance component, which is the constituent immunity, and this is the constant surveilling and the constant production of peptides and enzymes and cells that keep us healthy. So these are things and the energy goes into when we are healthy and they help to keep us healthy. The other side of immunity or maintaining homeostasis is returning to homeostasis if there's been an impact or a perturbation. And this we can call resistance. And this is the immune response. So if a coral gets sick, if it bleaches or gets an infection, we will see immune activity increasing and this will help to return the coral to a healthy state. Now we know that constituent immunity, which is the immunity levels when an organism is healthy, determines the tolerance to impact or perturbations. Now this is absolutely key. So we've known this for nearly 10 years. This is work that I did on the Great Barrier Reef where I looked at about 22, I think it was, different coral species and measured their levels of immunity when they were healthy. And what I found was that those corals like parietes species that had really high levels of immunity were much less likely to bleach or to get an infection. And those corals that invested small amounts of energy into immunity and so had really low levels of immunity when they were healthy were much more likely to get diseased and to bleach. This is crucial because this means we can measure a parameter in a coral and predict how tolerant it will be to a future event. This was published 10 years ago. So from this work, I have brought it forward and updated it a bit and begun to think about how this might interact with the microbiome, which corals also live in dynamic equilibrium with and rely on. So I proposed the damage threshold hypothesis, and this is considering how an organism, how a coral might live with a microbiota, so to be able to tolerate microorganisms, but also be able to resist disturbance, which might be from a pathogen that it ordinarily lives in equilibrium with. So the damage threshold in this context is the maximum amount of damage that can be tolerated before harm is caused. So now I'm going to take you through a few graphs which explain how immune activity might be used in different coral species or different corals to determine how tolerant they may or may not be to perturbations. So these are hypothetical models of what might be going on with their immune system at different times which enable them to either survive a perturbation or succumb to it. So in this first graph we've got immune activity in the solid black line and we've got damage burden in the dashed line. Damage burden is more simply just damage, it's the damage that's occurring to the tissue, to the coral at any given time. And along the bottom there, we do have time. The gray line is damage threshold, which again is the maximum damage that can be tolerate, tolerated without causing harm. Now that means that actually we can tolerate a certain level of damage at any given time, but we need to have enough immunity to be compensating for that. So if we get scratches or if we have come into contact with a pathogen, we won't necessarily get sick, but our immune system that we have under constituent, just healthy levels, will be able to cope with it. So if we look at the graph, we can see that even under healthy conditions, which is A to B, there is a certain level of immune activity. That is the constituent level of immunity under healthy conditions. And we can see that the damage burden is about the same. And it's quite a long way before we get to the damage threshold, which is the grey horizontal line. So when we have a perturbation, 
what we see is an immediate increase in both the damage burden and immune activity. Now, in order to stay healthy or to ensure that we don't become too ill, we need to ensure that the immune activity is on top of and able to overcome the damage burden to be able to bring it back down. Now, if the perturbation is quite extreme, the damage burden will at some point breach the damage threshold at D. But hopefully at this point, if you've got a strong immune system, the immune activity will be able to do this too and to be able to bring the damage burden back down below the damage threshold. So in this example, at D, the immune activity and the damage burden have gone beyond the damage threshold. So this is the immune response. There has been damage and harm caused to the coral. It's become sick, but the immune system is able to cope with it. So at C, we can see that the immune activity is bringing the damage burden back under control, and by E, it's gone back below the damage burden. So there's still the results of the perturbation there, but actually the immune activity is compensating for it really easily. And then it returns to the previous levels of activity. Now, between D and E, that's the time taken for homeostasis to be re-established, and that is also known as resilience. So this is an example or a hypothetical model of the immune activities of a coral that is tolerant, that has got a high level of tolerance. If we look at the opposite end of the spectrum here, we have an example or a hypothetical model of a coral that is really susceptible to disease and bleaching or to perturbations as a whole. And if we notice the differences between these two graphs, they're set up in the same way, so we have immune activity in the black line and damage burden in the dashed line and then damage threshold with grey. We can see that overall there is a really low level of constituent immune activity. So that is the black line on the graph that is almost at the axis. This coral is not investing much energy into immune activity under healthy conditions. And that means a damage threshold is significantly lower than in the previous example. And it means that the damage burden is relatively higher and much closer to that damage threshold. What this means is that this coral might have more energy to invest into growth or reproduction under healthy conditions, but it's more of a high risk model. Because as soon as there's a perturbation, that damage burden is going to shoot beyond the damage threshold. So immediately the coral is in trouble. Immediately there's damage occurring within its tissues and the immune activity needs to be much higher. The immune response needs to be much bigger in order to compensate for that if it's going to be able to recover. Now in this example, what we have here is immune activity that never gets back on top of that damage burden. It doesn't have enough resources. It's not able to mount an immune response that's strong enough to compensate for the damage and to recover. So if we consider this hypothetical model of immune activity that promotes tolerance but is actually energetically costly, we can start to think about how this might be important for future coral restoration projects. And particularly if we think about how constituent levels of immunity, so immunity under healthy conditions, relates to tolerance of perturbations. So we know that for many organisms they have immune memory, which means that an organism is better able to cope with an event if they've seen a similar event previously. And one way that this can happen is where after a perturbation, constituent levels of immunity are not returned to the previous baseline levels. So this means that if we take the first part of this graph, which is a copy of the previous graphs I just showed you, we've got immune activity in the black line, a perturbation which causes a spike and an immune response. But instead of returning back to the previous levels, the constituent immunity remains slightly elevated. And as such, this shunts the damage threshold a little bit higher, 
meaning that that coral is now better able to tolerate a future event. Now, if this happens consistently, then what we might see is a mechanism by which corals are better able to survive future events. And interestingly, we have a real world example of this, where on the Great Barrier Reef, we had two consecutive bleaching events, 2016, 2017. Now the 2017 event was actually a stronger event, but fewer corals succumb to that event, they seem to have a level of immunity to it. So what taking an immunological approach to coral reef restoration does, or at least tells me, is that there is hope. That actually there are ways that we can use coral physiology and our understanding of it to optimise coral reef restoration, which means that even if we can't change the environmental conditions that they're going to be exposed to, maybe we can change the corals that are going to be exposed to them. So we can be selective in the corals we put into our reef restoration projects and we can continue to learn about their immunity and what helps to keep them healthy. So I think there's room here for optimism, but we need to use and really engage with the scientific information and evidence that we have if we're going to be successful. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what Seeking Survivors is doing and has been doing within Sector Marino and around Sector Marino. So for a couple of years now we've been studying 14 sites sort of from quite close to Joaquina Keel across the, the north of the Santa Rosa Peninsula and at Isas Mosielago. So we have these 14 reef sites and at each reef site we've got corals that are tagged. We've got multiple different coral species tagged at each site depending on which species are present. And we're following these corals through time. So we have about four field trips a year and at each trip we go and find the corals that have tags. We photograph them with a scale to monitor their size and growth through time. And we also take small samples to measure their constituent levels of immunity. And this is so that we can begin to build up a picture of how healthy baseline or how constituent levels of immunity varies through space and time for each of the different coral species. And this is particularly important for the upwelling and non-upwelling seasons where coral immunity might be doing different things even at healthy baseline. So here's a graph just to show you some of our preliminary results. We've got phenoloxase activity on this graph, and that is one of the key parameters of immunity in corals and also in invertebrates in general. And what's really interesting to note is that of all of the coral species that we are investigating, Pocillopora has the lowest levels of immunity under healthy conditions, so that's the constituent levels of immunity. And if we think back to Isla San Pedrito, which prior to the 2009 event, it was a carpet of Porcel Opera. And then as soon as that event occurred, they disappeared. So this result is in line with that. Porcel Opera has the lowest levels of constituent immunity, which means it's the most susceptible to perturbations. It's also consistent with what I found on the Great Barrier Reef. Now, going to the other end, of this graph, we've got Parites and Pavona, which have the highest levels of constituent immunity and therefore are the most tolerant to perturbation. Similarly, on the Great Barrier Reef, I found that Parites also had the highest levels of immunity and was the most tolerant. So this provides some hope that actually measuring immunity is a valuable way to move forward and it can give us some indication of tolerance to perturbations. So looking just at postal operas now, which are present at each of the sites that we investigate, again we've got phenoloxidase activity, which is a strong indicator of immune activity. Again, this is healthy baseline, and this is looking at the immunity levels of postal opera at each of the different sites. And what's really interesting here is that it's also variable. So some sites have postal opera with higher levels of immunity than at other sites. So for example, out at the islands, Isopilava and Lara 
have got higher levels of immunity for their postal operators, and the lowest level of immunity is, is among Bithaya and Matapalita, which are both host to Bayas and Helena. So again, this is really interesting because this shows that there is variability in immune activity um, among the sites that we're studying, and it gives us information to start refining and coming up with a really solid plan if we're going to talk about optimizing coral reef restoration. So of course, seeking survivors is about science and the science that needs to drive effective conservation, but we can't have effective conservation if we don't engage with local communities and local people. And this has been a really wonderful aspect of the work that we've been doing um, in and around ACG and getting to know the members of the community of Kokinokia and working really closely with them, particularly for the periods of time that we're doing field work. And it's really important not just to um, to be able to do the field work, of course, they're amazing at facilitating that, but also gaining these, this understanding of what it's like to live there and what they need. And some of the interactions I've had have been really eye-opening um, on both sides. For example, um, a member of the girl takes a full day to catch what they used to be able to catch within one hour. And they didn't really have any explanation for this, but it was sort of trying to impress on me, impress on me how um, hard it was and how you know, that was really difficult because it's a challenging environment to work in anyway. And it wasn't until I began to talk about the importance of corals and how the organisms and the fish and the crustaceans and the things that they're looking for when they go out fishing are dependent on the corals and then that the corals had crashed in 2009, then I started to get this real understanding from them and they realized actually there is a really strong connection there and without the corals, the, the fish aren't gonna be there. They're not gonna be there in the numbers that we all need. And it was so nice to see that change of perspective and to see that understanding and they just wanted to learn more and more and more and how they could help. And if we're thinking about proactively conserving any system or any amount of biodiversity, of course, we need to have engaged local people who are positive and proactive and wanting to learn a genuinely wonderful aspect of, of working here. We're also working in San Jose at the Instituto for Mil Picado. This is so that we can do the lab analysis for the immunity. And this, again, has been really wonderful to work with a completely different group of people and to be working in an immunology lab with Costa Ricans from San Jose. Here we've got Tatiana Villalobos, who's the research assistant for Seeking Survivors, and Sammy Donin, who is a student who'll also be doing some work um, in the lab and in the field as Seeking Survivors continues. We also have a British contingent and based in the UK and in order to progress the, the theory of the, the damage threshold hypothesis and to gain as much information as possible about the dynamics of Nidarian immunity and how we might be able to harness that to optimize restoration, I've developed a clonal army of anemones and these are Aptasia or ex -Aptasia, and I'm using them as a model organism for the corals. And so we are running different experiments to see how the immunity and how the microbes can change under different stressful conditions. And the National Marine Aquarium has been extremely supportive with this endeavor, as have these students who have been doing a lot of the anemone husbandry, and we are working towards creating a dedicated Seeking Survivors Aquarius set up at the back of house and at front of house we'll be having a reef tank that's dedicated to Costa Rican coral communities and the work of seeking survivors and so it will become really accessible to the public. So what does this all mean for the future of ACG's coral communities? Really, again, it's a mixed bag for me. I think sometimes when I'm working you know, every day on this and I'm thinking about the future and climate change, it's, it can be a really bleak outlook. And when I'm diving on reefs where it's a coral graveyard, it's really difficult to, it's really difficult. And it's easy to sort of get entrenched in this negative outlook. 
But actually, I think particularly for Santa Maria and the reefs and reef communities close to ACG, we have a lot to be optimistic about. We've got a group of really passionate people from so many different walks of life who want to make positive change. We've got an enormous amount of expertise and amount of interest and an amount of drive to to do this. And I think that, that that gives real hope that we can make a positive change. What is absolutely essential though is that we work collaboratively and we work based on the scientific evidence and always forward thinking. Even if something doesn't seem like it might pay off in the long run, if we do it with excellent planning and careful steps and sharing of information, I think we have a really good chance of making a really positive difference and being able to restore the reefs of ACG. Of course, the work that I presented today and other work that is more behind the scenes and that I haven't had the chance to talk about so far is down to the contributions of many, many people and lots and lots of hard work. And so there's a short list here of some of those contributors. Of course, there are many more. So I want to say a big thank you to them. And thank you for listening. And I hope I'll be able to answer some of your questions.